Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to The Business Brew. This episode's super special to me because it highlights a one-of-a-kind individual, Wall Street legend, Jim O'Shaughnessy. He's got a lot to say about life, the way the brain works, markets, and everything in between. I've been really fortunate to get to know Jim over the past six months, and my life is way better because of it. On a professional note, I am thrilled to introduce my first sponsor, Coifin. Coifin is an awesome product that displays financial information simply and elegantly. It was founded by Rob Coifman. Rob is an ex-hedge fund guy who really values the display of financial information in an elegant and concise manner. I think he's built an amazing product, and it's not just me that thinks it because Coifin is one of the fastest growing platforms for financial data and analytics to research stocks and understand market trends. I discovered him thanks to many of my friends, many of which are on FinTwit. Elliot and Shomik, two past guests of the show, highly recommended that I talk to Rob, and I'm really grateful that I did. Um, the best way to describe the product would be a Bloomberg light with tons of high quality fundamental data, a powerful graph engine that can show it all clearly, and a user interface that doesn't look like it was built in the 90s. If you're an individual investor, research analyst, portfolio manager, or financial advisor, do yourself a favor and check them out. You're not going to regret it. Sign up for free at koifin.com. That's K-O-Y-F-I-N.com. Yeah, they sponsored me. No, I'm not hawking a product I don't believe in. Rob's legit. Koifin's legit. Sign up. Figure it out for yourself. So, without further ado, please enjoy the episode with Jim. As always, none of this is financial advice. All of the information contained in this program is for entertainment purposes only. Please consult your financial advisor before making investment decisions and do your own due diligence. So with that out of the way, Jim, how you doing, man? I'm doing great. How are you, Bill? I'm uh, I'm well, man. I've been looking forward to this conversation for a long time. As have time. I, as have I. And we just had, I just had you on Infinite Loops with uh, another good friend of mine, Adam. Uh, and uh, that was a lot of fun. So let's, I'm still let's, not sure why I belong in that room, but I appreciate <laughs> it. Well, you belong, you belong. Well, uh, thank you very much. I, I think, uh, I don't know, Adam, Adam's a unique thinker. I was just happy to be a, a it part of it. It was a lot of fun. Indeed. So part of why I wanted to have uh, you as an opener is first and foremost, I want to thank you for some of the things that you helped me through last year as I kind of was experiencing a little bit of success. I didn't really know how to handle it and I turned to you and I really appreciate the advice that you gave me. And on top of that, I thought that what you did airing the conversation that we had about Robin Hood, uh, especially given who your friends are, I thought it was very, very courageous. So I want to thank you. And, uh, you know, the, my family has settled with them. Um, so my, my sort of fight with them is over as far as I'm concerned. And, uh, I, I think that the podcast that we did was a non inconsequential step towards a outcome that, Certainly isn't good, but is more palatable than could have been the alternative. So thank it you. It was that. my pleasure, Bill. And you know, uh, working your way through those things is hard. You know, it's just uh, th there's a great quote, which is "Whoever angers you controls you." And hmm. you know, I try to I try to think about that a lot when, like, if I'm miffed or whatever, um, I sort of think, well, okay, why? Why am I reacting this way? And if it's legitimate, like it certainly was in your case, uh, you know, then then I go, OK, so let's take some action steps uh, to correct this. You you and your family did that. And I'm, I'm happy to hear that uh, you're moving on. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm you know, I don't know. I'm, I'm happy to I'm happy to say that, you know, hopefully they're in the process of moving on, whatever that looks like for them. Right. Who knows? Right, but, right. uh, it could have been a lot worse. And, and I guess the only thing that if somebody hasn't heard me say it, uh, that I would add to what I have said about Robin hood in the past is 
they they really could have made uh, the lawsuit hellish for all parties involved. And I think that uh, there was a rational outcome that made sense, uh, you know, wish the circumstances were different, but I, I will give them props for doing the right thing at the right time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's so it's we're sitting on the razor's edge here, right? Because I, I support um, younger people you know, learning about investing and, and investing and doing those things. I think it's really great. And if you start young, uh, it, it's even more powerful. But, you know, I also get angry. I, I helped an older friend who never invested open an account, not at Robinhood. Um, and I got pretty angry because I won't name the broker. It's an online broker. But I had, a, I had to three times I had to say I do not want a margin account. And, yeah. you know, I mean, it's just some some subtle changes, right, could could uh, earn you really good props. So on the one hand, yes, very, very excited, worried a little bit about, you know, seeing the same thing happen again and again and again. People like paying attention to the narrative and, and uh, investing in things they don't know about. Uh, but on the other hand, I, I want young people to invest. I want them to learn about it. You know, I, when I was young, I started investing when I was, I guess, 20, 20 years old. And I was an options trader. And I thought I was king shit because I had done a uh, mathematical thing using Black-Scholes implied volatility that worked pretty well. It, it hit, you know, singles and doubles. But uh, it was working, working. And I was like, you know, cock of the walk. Uh, and, and, then, and then I got obliterated. And... I learned a ton from getting obliterated. So, I mean, I'm, I'm not wishing anyone, I, I'm not wishing that on anyone, obviously. Uh, but if, uh, you know, for people listening, especially younger people listening, if, if something bad does happen, learn from that and, and then, you know, get on a course of study. I know, Bill, you, chapter and verse, you, you've done all your studies, which is, I think, the right way to do this. But, well, I too started out losing money on options. So, uh it was it was an expensive education, which is perhaps why I'm um more passionate about it than maybe I should be because, you know, I guess the the charitable response to sort of like w w my mind goes to the negative place, mm. right? But if I wanted to argue the other side of it, I'd say, well, if I didn't get into options trading, then there's a reasonable chance I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing mm -hmm. now, right? And like it's very hard to see how the path uh, it, unfolds it's like that. It's like beforehand. that great uh, Cormac McCarthy. Oh, by the way, didn't you love the guy who fooled Twitter that he was Cormac McCarthy? I just thought that was the best <laughs> thing in the world. What a performance artist! But the real Cormac McCarthy has a great quote, which is, "You'll never know what worse luck your bad luck has saved you from." <laughs> huh. So, yeah. so I and I also think this is kind of an interesting learning exercise because. So many people like look at failure and they're afraid uh, they don't want to look bad in, in front of their peers or their spouse or, or whatever. And, and if you can reframe uh, failure, uh, I failed a lot of times on a bunch of stuff and, and you can reframe it to, hey, what can I learn from this? Then rather than like getting all nervous about it, et cetera, it gives you the impetus to say, you know what? Let's do it. Let's let's uh, let's try it and see. And and when you're able to remove that fear, it's really difficult to put it into words, but it's really powerful. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I I guess that. So I have two thoughts going on. One of them is I think that people are hardened from their failures, which is one reason that I like when people will come on and talk about their failures on the show, because I think it's very easy to say, oh, well, you know, these people look at where they're at and they never had any problems. And I have, I have failure and, you know, I can't be that right. It's like, well, you don't know the backstory of that person. <laughs> so it's kind of nice to have people be honest. And then the other thing that, that I have going on in my head, and I don't know which way you want to fork the conversation, but 
I didn't think that we'd get to a point where the options market appear to be driving the underlying. Mm. So, and that's kind of something that scares yeah. me. Yeah. Uh, what did Greenspan call him? Uh, or actually, it was Warren Buffett, maybe. Uh, d- d- yeah, weapons, weapons of, of mass, mass destruction. destruction. And, you know, I saw that uh, over my career. These kinds of things happen at very kind of cyclically. Um, and I've seen it many, many times. Uh, and what happens is an event. <laughs> and, and the event is an unhappy one. And uh, people come back to their senses and and start looking at the the underlying again. I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of really good uh, thesis out there. I know Mike Green's got one about the rise of passive investing and how, and target date funds and what's that doing. I don't completely agree with him, but uh, I think that it's a very interesting thesis. Uh, but I always kind of like we'll see, right? Because. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, unsustainable trends tend not to sustain themselves. That uh, I think Herbert Stein, uh, and 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 things that you think are going to go on forever stop. And you know, I've been lucky enough over the course of my career to experience that personally, many, many, many times. And so I always just try to keep um, a dispassionate view towards what I do. Um, and you know, look, it's, uh, the, the, the entire way that we look at investing is all, you know, directional probabilities. And, uh, you know, when, when we buy a, a basket of stocks because of the underlying factors that they have, we do that knowing full well that X percent of them are going to fail. And I was saying that to a friend of mine, who's a more traditional investor. And he's like, I, I would never buy a stock that I thought had a chance of failing. And I'm like, well, that's, you know, that's one of the guidelines that we use. We, you know, we know the failure rate. We are able to look through analysis at drawdowns and some of them are terrifying. And the problem with it is that I've experienced many, many times, especially when I've ever engaged with the end investor rather than a, an advisor or whatnot. You know, I cannot tell you the number of times, like when I started my first company, O'Shaughnessy Capital, we used to literally, people would come in because we took high net worth money directly back in those days. And I'd sit them down in the office and they all came in wanting the strategy from what works on Wall Street that was the best performer. And and mm. like, so most of these people were 60 plus. And, and so I'd sit them in the conference room and I'd say, okay, cool. But I want to show you the 10 worst drawdowns for that strategy and like some of them were 55 percent and this is pre great yeah. financial crisis and they would look at it and eight out of ten of them are like yeah no i don't think i want that strategy <laughs> <laughs> so i was looking for the return yes, without the that's risk what I sir. Want. can you can you give me that <laughs> If I could give you that, I wouldn't be meeting with you because I'd have my own country. Also, can we lower your fees yeah, while we're at it? Exactly, Thank you very much. Exactly. Of course. Of course. <laughs> it, uh, the game doesn't change, or the clients don't at least. The game may. Yeah. So when you started, you you said you were an options trader. If I recall correctly, you were hitting singles and doubles, and then you stumbled upon an academic paper that exposed your strategy. Is I did that indeed. Fair? It's very fair. So... Uh, I've always been a research junkie, um, and back when it was hard, uh, literally, you had to get in your car, go down to the uh, research library. In my case, I grew up in St. Paul, Minnesota, so the library was the James J. Hill, uh, who was a railroad uh, robber baron, um, and uh, took after Mr. Carnegie in giving libraries, uh, and literally, like, go through microfiche. I don't even know if you know what that is. Uh, 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 I do. I was trained on that uh, okay. in grade school. Well, there you go. So I haven't used so, it in a while, though. I'll right, admit right. that. Well, neither have I. Neither have I. <laughs> uh, so I, I was early into the metaverse. I like adopting technology very, very early. But so I, it stopped working, literally. And I'm like, okay, something, something's going on here. So I went down there, and, and lucky for me, they had a collection of all the you know uh, journal of portfolio management, et cetera, et cetera all of the really geeky 
um, uh, stuff uh, on, on mostly academic, a lot of practitioners too. Uh, and I went through it, I went through it, I went through it and found it. And it was an academic, I can't even remember, I think he was at the University of Illinois, uh, although I might have to be corrected on that. Anyway, I had kind of a instant aha, which was mathematical anomalies, once identified and disclosed, go away. So, you know, they're like the old anomaly where you could trade um, Royal Dutch, which traded in New York and traded in London, and you could arb the difference in price because there were no computers, right? Uh, the, the minute that that technology was there, it went away for the most part. And, mm. and that kind of led me on my path of, well, w what can't get armed away? And, you know, as I often say, you know, markets change second by second. Human nature hasn't changed millennia by millennia. Arbitraging human nature is the final edge. And the thing about human nature that's really interesting to me is the first paper I wrote, I wrote in 1987, and essentially it was all about behavioral finance. It wasn't called behavioral finance back then. They just called it psychology. Uh, but mm -hmm. we've had this data for 60 years on a variety of things, not just the market, um, in human decision making. We suck. And for the most part, we get caught in bad heuristics and, and rules of thumb that sound right but they really aren't right. And, and we hmm. have a very hard time correcting the error. And so like, I'm a huge fan of Danny Kenneman, of Andy Duke, of all of the people who are really working hard to, to get people to understand this. But the fact is we get it intellectually, but that isn't the part of our brain that takes over when, when we're panicking, right? It's like, yeah. And when we're panicking and, and, you know, you do this, that isn't really you. It's not the front. It's not this part. It's the ancient part of your brain that basically is danger running away. And that is unless you have a process in place that mitigates that willpower is not enough. It's just it's not. And and so, you know, kind of leading me into the thing that really cemented it for me was something I've written about, uh, was going into the crash of 1987. I had amassed the largest put position on uh, the OEX, which you know was a proxy for the S&P. Hmm. Um, I had never had that big of a position. Um, and really? I was like... Long or short, you were. this was your biggest directional bet to date? Uh, well, wow. no, no, no. I've, been, I've, I've made okay. bigger directional bets, uh, but but okay. this was my first one. Okay, um, and okay, yeah, yeah, and yeah. So okay. I'm 27 years old, and you know I'm. I meant up, up to oh, that. Point, oh yeah, this up, is up like your that. first real definitely, big call, definitely. And I had huh. developed another uh, sort of mathematically based um, uh, system in a, in a similar manner to the one that got outed by the academic. Anyway, it was suggesting things are like really, really pricey here. And so hmm. I just methodically put together this put position. And so when I started, which was kind of like in August, the puts weren't, the premiums weren't really crazy. But as I continued to add to the position, I actually took it as good news that the premiums were just like going up, 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 up for the puts. Hmm. Long story short, uh, the day before the crash of the market was a horrible day. Uh, it was down like 100 points, which was 7 or 8% or whatever. And that was back when I still listened to narrative. And so I had on, I guess it was FNN, which got taken over by CNBC. Um, and like everybody they had on, everybody was like, that's it. This is this is cleared out all of the weekends. You gotta you huh. gotta get in there and buy. Now this is right. This is like a half an hour before the close. So I call the broker. I'm like, "What are you thinking here?" And he's like, "Dude, get out of this position." And like, <laughs> I pan I panicked. 
And huh. I got I made an emotional decision and I sold the entire position at a really oh. small gain. Didn't lose, that but a really sucks, small gain at, that would have oh. been worth I it, I used to keep the calculation just to remind me that that oh, that, that brutal, Uber is, uh, has a extracts a big price. But but again looking at failure it cemented in me the fact that I wasn't any but any different than any other person operating human OS, right? Hmm. And 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 so when I got clear of that and understood, hey, you know, I'm just as much of a cosmic schmuck here as anyone else is, I gotta figure out a process that allows me to derail these emotional uh, decisions. And and hmm. so I look at that trade, even though it was like, and this speaks directly to what we were talking about earlier, right? Uh, like a lot of people would look at that and just, you know, just be angry and, oh my God, I can't believe I, I did that. I'm such an idiot, blah, blah, blah. I looked at it as the best thing that ever happened to me be, because- Yeah, well, it was a great lesson, A great right? lesson, but it also set me on the path of- I'm, I'm just going to be a pure quant. And li listen, by yeah. the way, uh, that's my path. It doesn't have to be your path. It doesn't have to be anyone's path. W w what I advocate for people is find the thing that works right for you, right? I, I have a friend in Vienna, and he he's not a quant. But what he does is almost as good. Like he, he's a trader and, and we, we're not traders, as you know, we're investors. Um, but what he does is when a position is going against him, he literally has programmed himself to get up out of his chair, go to his hmm. locker, put his running gear on, run a couple miles and come back. And what he hmm. found that that by and large works really, really well for him. So. Uh, it, hmm. I, I'm not here to proselytize on uh, a method that's worked well for me. I, I mean, sure, read about it, take some take some examples from it, learn, but you've got to find something that you know that you can stick with, right? And and so everybody's different, and there's lots of paths towards success. But if if, if you think that you're going to be able to do it through your clever insights and your ability and willpower to um, overcome your emotions, I got, uh, I got I, I, the probabilities are very, very high. I'm sure there's some person out there who can do that. Uh, but yeah, like maybe uh, Buffett, not yeah, even him. I mean, so, so the, again, learn to think in terms of probabilities. The probabilities are very bad for you there. And that is not a bet you want to make. If you, if you, like I always say to people, if you're in Vegas, own the casino. Don't be the guy walking in the front door. Yeah, you know who I wonder. Uh, I wonder if Jesse Livermore, when he was at the top of his game, was pretty good with emotions. I would imagine. But then again, if I remember the story correctly, they took him down in the end. So, so. he's a fascinating character, um, and uh, I honestly don't think that he was uh, as in control of his emotions as many people feel. Uh, I think that mm. he got um, he got really full of himself after calling correctly the crash of 29 and walked around with bodyguards because people, you know, they blamed him and they wanted to kill him. <laughs> mm. uh, but then if you look at his career, he also had a history of depression which is can be yeah. tough. Uh, he lost it all, made it all, lost it all. And after the lost it all, killed himself in the men's room of the Sherry Netherland Hotel in Manhattan. Uh, so, yeah. I mean, I love the book Reminiscence of a Stock Operator. One well, of the absolutely. Best. It's like whenever anyone asks me, I say, read that one first because it's re yeah. the thing that's great about it is it also reminds you uh, what I often tell people is read the book and and then just fill in names of today and and, and what yeah. you're gonna you're gonna feel like you're on Twitter reading somebody's tweet about you know 
GME. <laughs> and, and because we don't change, man. We, we just yeah. don't change. Yeah. The thing that sucks about your put position is you were right. Like, I, I, if I can speak for you, it sounds like when you saw the vol go up, you knew that the option or had a strong premonition you asserted, I should say, in the spirit of our old of our previous conversation, yeah. uh, that the the volatility going up maybe knew something that the equity didn't did. know, yeah. right? Because you said it like it was a positive indicator. Oh, to you, right? absolutely. So you're paying more for premium and you're excited about it because you think you're going to be right, and then to cut that bet short sucks. Well, again, yeah, but I, I get it. I, I I take a very different view of that. Um, so. Uh, yeah, I, I like to look at math, uh, because it, it doesn't, uh, have an agenda for the most part. And, you know, vol going up, the market's telling me something that I don't know. Uh, the market is always smarter than you are. Anyone who thinks they're smarter than the market is going to end poorly, I think. Um, yeah. but the lesson that I learned about power of emotion to screw up our even the best laid plans right um there's a great uh quote from proust that i put up periodically on uh, twitter which is um uh, guided and this is paraphrasing it guided by uh feelings that are destined not to last we make our irrevocable choices and mm. and and that speaks to me because you know how many times in the heat of the moment have you made a decision that like six weeks later when you're looking back on it you're like how could i have been so dumb well you could have been so dumb because your body got filled up with cortisol and your emotions and your amygdala were like i'm running the show now i'm the captain now uh and yeah and and time to fight or flight and and what happens is six weeks later that's all gone and so you're you're able to see clearly what happened but you know in in kind of my first book i i i said successful investors unstick themselves from time the past the present Hmm. and the future make up their now and and what I what I mean hmm. by that is, we we overweight we give way more weight to whatever we read today or saw today or whatever, and and then we straight line it into the future, right? Mm-hmm. You're you're much better off making it a continuous wave, right? And and looking at that. And thinking, okay, well, we'll see. It engenders, it engenders um, a level of humility about your own prowess that um, isn't present if you're like thinking in the only here and now. Uh, you know, another another thing that I I just passionately believe in is uh, people are are way too quick to become prematurely certain about things and you know you mentioned our work together i mean that's one of the parts of what i do is what i'm trying to work with somebody is like uh that that's wrong and and what you want to do is you want to try to remain as open uh to uh what might happen and the probability distribution of that right um and and be a little more like Spock and a little less like Captain Kirk, um, and that's hard. You, you literally have to train yourself a lot to think this way because it's not a natural way of thinking. And you know, it's it's like I was talking to somebody yesterday, um, and we were talking about how is it that these gurus, man, they still get the gig. They still get put on, you know, financial media. They still get paid for their speeches. And they're all about certainty. And only the madman is certain, in my opinion. And, and so, again, it's, it's, it's a, a, a feature, not a bug, of human OS. We crave certainty so much that 
even if, even if like we were going to go see some guru, right? And 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 right before we walked into the auditorium, uh, we got handed a, a list that showed you know his or her last forty calls, and thirty eight of them were wrong. We're, we're still going to go in and listen to him, and you know what? He's going to be so certain in his attitude or she that that you're going to believe them. There's a lot of good stories about this, but and it it springs from our very human desire for the illusion of control. A lot of things that happen are random, and and that does not sync well with the way human brains work. So so we construct narratives usually after the fact uh, for that that make sense to us. So my buddy Rory Sutherland is really great on this. You know, he's like, the, the, the brain is not the command center or the Oval Office. It's the press office, man. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, it's there to make you sound like, like you really thought this out. The fact is you didn't. You, you made the decision emotionally, and then you paper it over. Some people don't even paper it over. You paper it over with, you know, what a plausible sounding uh, rational uh, reason for what you've done. So it, it, if you if you want to get really good at this, you really have to do a deep dive on behavioral psychology, on genetic behaviorism. I'm I'm there right now. Some of that stuff is really scary. Uh, you know, there's a, a, a study done by uh, some academics where they looked at identical twins and it's it's pinned on my uh on my uh twitter page um and what they found was that because identical twins are clones right um yeah it should be yeah. the same so in theory yeah right? <laughs> so so what they what they found was that as much as 45 percent of investment behavior, you know, buying and selling and et cetera. Mm, I did yeah, read yeah. this. Uh, I did read this. Genetic, and here's the part here's the part that's scary, is genetic and cannot be educated against. Yeah. So so we're complicated creatures. I was on a really fascinating call yesterday uh, with a physicist uh, expounding on on some things that I think is really cool. Uh, but I asked him a question about consciousness, like, what is this thing you think is cool? Oh, well, so um, why causes precede effects uh, was the title of his talk. Hmm. Um, and okay. uh, Santa Fe Institute and these people are wicked smart. Um, and so but I the question I asked was, so how does consciousness come into everything that we're doing here? And then we kind of got into this conversation about we we still have no idea really there is no like well-formed uh thesis or hypothesis about why we're conscious about how that gets hmm. enabled um it's like when you start looking into this stuff you're like hmm i think maybe more people should have known should know about that it's like a anesthesia hmm. oh how does anesthesia work we don't know. <laughs> Can I ask you a follow up on this study? Just because now you got my brain sure. going, uh, and it's—I it, think it's my conscious mind that's coming up with this. Um, do you? Th <clears throat> did they comment in the study of the twins? Uh, you know, when they said that it can't be unlearned, do you think that it can be unlearned if you can train your subconscious mind to change the way that? it thinks through the power of habit or however you talk to yourself or, you know, I mean like some, some really different way of yeah. change, right? Not like a, you know, like at the base yeah. level that uh, you and I've chatted about that at length uh, because of uh, uh, Arnold and uh, what a, that was like, I think one of your best podcasts, by the way, uh, He's the man. That, that was that. Was, I had nothing to do with it, Jim. I just got out of the way, <laughs> like I'm gonna do here. Uh, he was. He's awesome. And for those who haven't heard it, uh, I highly recommend listening to it. Uh, he uh, overcame like incredible things in his life to be a great success. And one of the tools that he used was um, uh, self hypnotism, um, and uh, and 
uh, an explore, exploration of the power of the unconscious, subconscious, I mean, whatever name you want to put on it, uh, mind. Yeah. And, and so, uh, by the way, if, if people who are listening are interested, uh, go to YouTube and type in Milton Erickson, who is probably the godfather of this. This guy's accomplishments were crazy good. He could like literally uh, in two sessions cure somebody who hadn't been able to leave their house for five years because they were agoraphobic. Hmm. So that's an interesting that's an interesting segue, uh, Bill, because maybe, maybe uh, I hadn't thought about it. Um, I think the way I thought about it was, well, maybe it could be changed if you put these guardrails, these a uh, process around it. Um, yeah. But uh, that'd be worth exploring for sure, because, uh, y- you know, it's kind of like this idea of metaprogramming and you can do it. It's really hard to metaprogramming is essentially programming your own mind. Um, and repetition is that like neuro linguistic type stuff? That's yeah, or different. It, that uh, the neuro linguistic uh, uh, stuff is part of it. Uh, that's yeah. Bandler and Grinder, and I read that stuff when I was like twenty and kind of forgot. And then a friend in Florida was like, uh, who's uh, an old school psychologist, but he's been an advisor for years and years. Uh, was like, uh, he, he called me on the phone. He's like. You, you do realize that you are using uh, uh, NLP techniques all the time. And I'm hmm. like, what? No, I'm not. He goes, Jim. And, and so he emailed me this thing and he had, he had underlined pacing and leading is like one of their big things. Um, and so pacing and leading is really easy. I would just say to you, Bill, uh, are you doing a podcast with me right now? Yes, I am. And uh, are you uh, looking over to see what your kids are getting into uh, over there? Yes, <laughs> okay. I am. Unfortunately, right, right. And 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 then, so so that's the pacing part where I'm getting you to say yes, 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 and 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 uh, then I lead you where I want you to go. Sure, you uh, do. And, and, that's and, smart. And then, and then you are going to go. Yeah, yeah. That makes sense. That's right. You are yeah. leading me. <laughs> so, so all of that stuff is very instructive, I think, uh, because it it helps you understand that. Th- I'll be honest. Their early books are pretty technical, and it's all about the structure of language, right? And hmm. and it, I find it very interesting, uh, and I learned a lot from it, uh, but. The, the bottom line is, yes, there are techniques that you can use. Uh, the one that you and I worked on together was the thread that I wrote called The Thinker and the Prover. Um, and I'm a huge believer in, listen, you know why propaganda works? It works because they just repeat the same message time and time and time and time again. And here's the interesting part about that. They do it in such a manner that your conscious mind ignores it. If in fact, it gets hmm. irritated by it and ignores hmm. it, guess what doesn't ignore it? Your subconscious mind. Hmm. And if you do, if you study the subconscious mind, and I'm sure most of this we'll find out is wrong, but at least it's effective, right? George Box, all models are wrong, some are useful. Um, and, and so w- what? why it works is because the subconscious, at least on the theories that are working today, is quite literal. And it also uh, does not have a sense of time. So, hmm. so uh, if you believe something deeply about yourself, that's what's going to happen. Because your subconscious mind, it, and you know, by the way, it doesn't even have to be you to believe it. There are some studies that have replicated where they lied to a group of teachers telling them that, you know, these 12 kids that were picked totally at random, by the way, these 12 kids all are gifted. Okay. Oh, I think I read this study. And, and, and they, they went away and they came back a year later and guess who was getting the best scores in the class? Those randomly, randomly uh, chosen kids. So, you know, it's, it's, you 
it's one of the, the reasons that I believe very strongly in the power of words uh, because they become symbols, symbols dominate, and, and if they get lodged into your unconscious or your subconscious mind, you know, I worked with a guy once where literally his thing was he deeply believed that he did not have the right, and, and he used that word, the right to make more than $80,000 a year. Huh, what a limiting belief. And, and guess what? <laughs> he never made more than $80,000 a year, despite the fact that he was maybe one of the most talented guys I'd ever met. And, and I'm talking, this guy... Where'd that come from? Well... I mean, if you're at liberty to say, I mean, it sounds like it's got to be something that happened in his childhood Well, most, mo most of know. it is in your childhood. Um, yeah. I've been to men's groups, Jim. Have you ever been to a men's actually, group? Actually, when I was in YPO, Young President's Organization, they had things called forums, which I thought were the most useful part of the entire membership. Oh, yeah. I did tell you this. Yeah. yeah when I got all riled up and I screamed at somebody, I thought it was my parents. It was actually a good, good experience at the end, but it was wild. To yeah, be in. it is. But, you know, talk therapy uh, has proven to be one of the most efficacious um, of all the therapies. And here's the, here's the rub. It doesn't matter who you're talking to. I, it, can, it can be a psychologist. <laughs> yeah. It can be a psychiatrist. It can be a bartender. It can be your buddy. It can be anyone. And, and we found that, like, so to, the ability to express it, right? Um, I'm a big fan of a guy who just died recently, unfortunately, named Dr. John Sarno, um, who is a traditional MD, um, uh, practiced at NYU um, in rehabilitation. And he got so angry that the traditional ways that they were trying to treat things like back pain just didn't work. And so he hmm. did this deep dive um, and found that there was a strong mind-body connection and that a lot of these pains were being caused by people repressing their emotions, mostly uncomfortable emotions, that they, hmm. for whatever reason, believed should not be expressed. So you're talking about rage. Huh, and it manifested itself in the yes. body. And, and there's wild. another great- Makes sense, but that's There's wild. another great book called The Body Keeps the Score. And um, so anyway, his success rate was crazy good. But one of, one of his qualifications was he would not treat you if you did not say that you were open to the possibility that this was correct. And again, yeah. now we're getting back to a limit, a limiting oh, that belief. kind of forces you to say yes. And then it like, it's the little carrot that you're chasing in it, your mind. Like at some point in your mind is already acknowledged. What, this could exactly. be my problem. And so, so I had in my late thirties, I just launched um, several mutual funds. It's getting a lot of press for what works on wall street. I was on CNBC all the time mostly because Mark Haynes and I were buddies and he really liked me. And back in those days, he got, uh, he really ran the show. Um, and huh. I actually want to touch on that later. Uh, but but yeah. anyway, um, I got this thing with my neck and my neck was frozen. Literally, I, I could not move more than there and, with, oh, without excruciating brutal. pain. And so I did what every normal person does. I went to my doctor. Um, and he's like, okay, well, I'm going to prescribe, you know, these analgesics and blah, 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 and we'll see how it goes. And, you know, hot, cold, you know, the drill, uh, and, yeah. and, and then nothing happened. And so then I went to a chiropractor who put me in traction and then I went, you know, I'll, I'll dispense with all of the things I went down. And so me being me, I'm like, okay, I got, there, there's gotta be some other way. So I went to the bookstore. Uh, went uh, and found this Sarno book uh, called uh, Mind Over Back Pain. I, I, I would recommend the current book that I recommend is uh, The Mind-Body Connection. Anyway, so I read the book. You know what I did after I read the book the first time? I threw it across <laughs> the room. My wife was walking in. She goes, what's going on? I, was, I just read the biggest this is pile bullshit. of bullshit in my life. This guy is a con man. This is bullshit. 
I can't believe. Uh, doesn't he know my I neck hurts? I can't believe that I spent time reading this fucking book. And so my wife goes and picks it up, and she's kind of paging through it, and she goes, I kind of see some aspects of your personality here. And I'm like, get angry. I, oh, I get funny. angry, right? You're I, getting I, I angrier, get, and your neck's get getting tighter, tighter, and you're exactly, talking about what bullshit exactly. it is. <laughs> so, so I reread it, I think, ultimately five times. And guess guess huh. what happened? One morning, I... Your neck what, started one, to heal itself. It didn't just start. One morning, I woke up, and it was gone gone huh. there's a great movie that i uh contributed a little bit to help finance the making of it called all the rage um and i think you get it on youtube or I, it's available broadly um and when you watch this man howard stern is a huge fan of sarno sarno cured stern's back problems um hmm. and anyway when you watch this movie though the, the, there's one person in particular that just blows me away she like in the beginning of it, she's on one of those little scooters because she can't walk. She literally cannot walk because she is in such horrible pain that she's got to, you know, like ride around on the scooter. And then, you know, it hmm. follows her with Dr. Sarno um, uh, through the movie. And, and the final shot is her jogging in Central Park. And wow. it's just like, Good exactly. And so, you know, there's a lot of stuff that if you're open to it, is can be really useful in repurposing, I guess, if you will, um, uh, to, to make your investment uh, uh, strategy work a bit better. And so I, I would definitely say um, I bet there would be something with uh, the subconscious. My problem is I think barriers are probably safer, to be fair. I'm not sure that people should be like, I'm going to reprogram my subconscious mind. Uh, I, <laughs> actually, the last time we talked, you know what I did almost immediately after? I uh, I wrote my two buddies, uh, Francisco and Alex, and I was like, if I ever put through any trade and I don't write you guys some memo before I do it, I'm sending you $250 each. Ah. Right? Just like as a forcing function. Good. Uh, that because I, I was thinking about some of the stuff that we had said, and I was like, I gotta, I need to write more, and I need to have more accountability around me, so that I'm not making behavioral mistakes. So you, yeah, I mean, the writing is something that I have been. That's one of my soapboxes. Um, writing is so powerful, and and on so many levels, right? So th the first thing about writing is you instantly understand if you understand something or not. When you try to when you try yeah. to write about it and you look at what you've written and it doesn't make any sense, you realize I have no clue. <laughs> I don't I know have what I'm no talking clue about. <laughs> what I'm talking about here, which drives yeah. you to further study. But the other thing that I really think is really helpful for writing is that it. Listen uh, again, back to human operating system. Our our memories are unreliable narrators, and and what happens is. There's this kind of automatic function where our memory upgrades, upgrades <laughs> uh, our, our, what we think we have as a memory to be consistent with what we believe now. And, and, yeah. and um, there's nothing like being called a liar in your own handwriting. And, and, and so my experience that uh, is easy to um, give as an example. So I was out uh, uh, pre-COVID uh, to dinner with friends and I don't know how it came up, but the, the first Gulf war, you know, where Kuwait was occupied by Saddam, um, and George Bush senior, uh, mounted the campaign to get him out of there. And they were like, so did you support that war? And I'm like, absolutely. I did. Uh, you know, that was just, that was like flag on the play, man. You can't do that. And the United at hmm. this point, the United States is the only real superpower left. And, you know, we have to do something about it. And and so that was it wasn't a long conversation. But anyway, it, it happened that I was doing some research into something that was uh, uh, I was doing around the same time. And I found an entry on the eve of our uh, invasion of Kuwait. And guess what? I was horribly opposed it. to it. And I actually and I, yeah. and I actually wrote 
for every innocent person we kill, we're going to create 10 jihadis. And, and like, pretty and, prescient. Well, but also totally wrong. <laughs> believing, yeah. believing well. that I, and, but, but it's a good illustration, I think, of we're not aware of that this happens to us, right? And so, we would swear, by the way, this is why eyewitness accounts should be basically just not allowed because because yeah. uh, they're wrong. And and there's a lot of studies that have uh, replicated. And you notice I always say have replicated and haven't replicated. That's really important. <laughs> if like so what works on Wall Street? I tried to do it as from as scientific an approach as possible and by that i mean what i wanted was to to disclose the way that i programmed it to come up with the results and because my goal was that if somebody else got that same data set and ran the test the same way they should get exactly the same results that i got right that means that they yeah. that they could replicate it and that you could take it seriously um, and so, uh, in, you know, there's a crisis going on, unfortunately now in actual science, it's like, I, I, I'm still trying to ponder how you manage to politicize a drug or a mask. It's insanity to me. Um, yeah, these are bizarre really, times, especially with all this information. Ex well, Exactly. And so it's almost the problem is so much information, right? So Claude Shannon, one of my heroes, who I think should be known as well as Albert Einstein, uh, came up with information theory. And, you know, everything we're doing, this, this, everything is because of uh, Shannon. And one of the things that he did, and this is what's so cool about these old school guys. I, I had the opportunity when I was still living in the uh, Twin Cities to meet Seymour Cray. Do you know that name? No. So, so he created the first supercomputer. And Oh, Cray, C-R-A-Y, yeah, sure. Yeah. And you know, do you know, yeah. how, he, you know okay. how he did it? All I have no idea. handwritten on legal pages. Yeah. Really? And I got to see him. It was so cool. Wow. So cool. Anyway, um, so one, one of the things that you find is when the information gets to a point, it, it, there's a technical term called the Shannon limit. And, and that limit is how much the human brain can actually take in before it starts going a little crazy. And, and many people are at their Shannon limit. And, and so it's like, you know, I've been writing and talking a lot about the thing I'm calling the great reshuffle. I think that we'll be able to figure this out and get around it. But I think that we need to also understand that information, calling anything an information age, uh, that's, that's done, that's gone. We got plenty of information and, and we'll continue to get more and it'll get better. Right. But now the game is how do you synthesize that? How do you turn it into actionable knowledge? Right. Th that's yeah. the way that you have to start thinking right now. You have to be really open minded. And this idea of being open to looking at things in a nonlinear way as opposed to a linear way. I mean, there's a lot going on, and and I think for those that can can use these new tools and these new ways of looking at things, the world is going to be an amazingly exciting place uh, over the next ten to twenty years. But there are also people who, you know, are are going to suffer. And so, with this information deluge tsunami, what people? It's for example, it's why you see all these conspiracy theories, right? When, when people get overwhelmed with not with information and and they're not good at um, at curating what they're looking at, um, they they reach a point where they just want it to stop. And so they seek simplicity, hmm. yeah. but not simplicity in, in the form that I would 
find it a virtue, right? Uh, but but simplicity, easy solutions, right? Uh, well, of course, it was group X, Y, or Z, right? And yeah. and then we scapegoat them, and and then you get these tribes warring with each other, and that descends into dogmatism and conspiracy theories because it's easier. It's just easier to believe that you know whatever. And you, there's so many these days that. And, and, and so, you know, that ultimately isn't great. I do have a theory, though, that, you know, the ability to vent on social media might not be 100% bad because, uh, again, back to talk therapy, right? So, so let's say you're really angry and I'm enraged. Uh, if you can get on Twitter or Facebook or whatever you want to do and... I hate so and so. Uh, yeah. That that's a steam valve, and you know, in in, in the <clears throat> older days, prior to being able, able to do that, you might have done something a lot worse. You might have like actually physically assaulted somebody, and I know we have that going on too. But so yeah, but I understand what you're saying. It's an outlet for people's minds, and I th I think if. Uh, as the receiving end, because I, I mean, I do this sometimes on investment ideas and some of the ones that I like to talk about are the more polarizing ones because it's more fun. Sure. I think that if somebody, if somebody jumps into the conversation <clears throat> and I kind of say like, okay, I acknowledge that you have a point, right. And just kind of deescalate like right off the bat, it m more often than not, a lot of people that seem angry up front really are not. And then it's like, okay, now let's have a conversation. Yeah. I think that uh, yeah, I I do the same. Um, I I I have been blessed with being like just totally chill in terms of people. You want to scream at me? Scream at me. It's not going to affect me in any way. And uh, but that couldn't have been so when you were building your business. Like, has this always been your personality trait, or has this happened in your? I'm not going to call you older age. That feels wrong. <laughs> as you've grown up, as you've become a fine wine, Jim. So when I was younger, um, I was, in fact, a proselytizer. I was a true believer. And I did all sorts of things uh, intentionally to stir up a ruckus, um, like at a big conference uh, in the early 90s telling a traditional portfolio manager that I could clone her portfolio and it would do better than her. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure she really enjoyed that, Jeb. I can't imagine how you could have not been friends after that. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So it did change kind of in my mid-30s when I realized I was reading a review of the first edition of what works on wall street that was like, this guy sucks. He's an idiot. He doesn't know, you know, blah, 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 blah. And I'm reading it. And rather than get angry, I just started to laugh. I'm just like, this hmm. is like really funny. This person is so clueless that they, they just like, don't understand what I'm, what I'm trying to get at here. And so I thought about that a lot and, when I was a younger guy, like a teenager, I had a temper problem. I was a classic Irish fella. And uh, I just realized through a series of things that happened that, that I couldn't be like that. And, and so I really worked at, um, uh, you know, I'd started reading Lao Tzu, uh, the Tao Te Ching. I, I read the Stoics. I read a, a lot of that. And I got a lot out of it. And it was kind of like, yeah, I'm, I'm doing this wrong. And, and hmm. so uh, it's, it has served me so incredibly well in my life because um, it, 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 there's just so, back to the quote I gave you at the beginning, whoever angers you controls you. And I'm, yeah. I, I, one of my big things is I'm not surrendering my agency to anyone. And, and both good and bad, by the way. Right. So so if I fuck up, I fucked up. 
I'm not going to say, oh, it was, you know, because of that, that dirty, rotten guy, Johnson. Remember uh, 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 Forrest Gump? Uh, you know, yeah. where, where you see people, whenever there's success, oh, I did that. Whenever there's failure, oh, that was that bastard Johnson, right? So that's surrendering agency. And when you do that, you lose your power, I think. And, and so for good and bad, you've got to retain your agency you got to own your decisions. And, and when you do that, just really great things happen because you, you realize that back to failures, I, I don't see them. I view them as like, really, what a great opportunity I just got to learn something. Yeah. And I'm also really big on unlearning things, right? So, and I changed my mind about things not like I, I don't have a list. I need to change my mind about this, but but organically. So uh, we talk about the great reshuffle. I'm now in favor of universal basic income, even though I know all of the empirical results that I've seen say it doesn't work so well. Um, we had to try something. And I think that I'm willing to throw in with trying that. I, I And by the way, if you if you study it, it's not a conservative or a liberal position. It's been advocated by both groups. And I think Milton Friedman, you know, Mr. Two Cheers for Capitalism, uh, was uh, a big advocate. And I like the way he, he framed it. It was like, you have the good fortune of being in the United States and being a citizen of the United States. Uh, you should get some of the benefits of that. And kind of, he kind of phrased it like, we should make them shareholders, so to speak. Yeah, I uh, I actually had an interesting conversation. I'm, I might even mess up the the term. I should let the person that has the idea come out with it. But uh, something like superannuation or something, where you're basically, you know, giving people equity, uh, but forcing them to lock up their savings for a while. You know, with with what you're giving them, you're not forcing them to do anything with what they earn. But I like that idea. I like the idea of giving equity to all the citizens because. I don't know. I worry about this wealth gap. As do I. And and I think that um, that's a neat solution from the way I look at things because um, the, the, it, it also creates an owner mentality. And if, if you've got yeah. an owner mentality, you think differently than if you don't. Um, my worry is, you know, I'm, I'm not a political person. I'm like, I'm typified by one thing, which is I'm fiercely anti-authoritarian. I'm fiercely in, in favor of freedom of speech, even speech that I might find abhorrent. Um, and uh, the rule of law, it's worked really well for our country. And, it, you know, you don't have to study history endlessly to see when that those things aren't in place, things go to shit. And, and so, but I think we've got a horrible class worldwide of politicians. And yeah, and, bad. and I worry, actually, that, you know, as part of this great reshuffle, we are so far ahead of them in the private sector. I mean, just look at look at medicine. Right. Why do you have to fill a paper form out the same one 10 different times with the same doctor when you go to visit? It's crazy. It's insane. Yeah. We have the technology that could be HIPAA compliant and and, and work, but the, the the problem that I'm seeing with our political class is that you know they're not they're not the sharpest tools in the shed, and and when you've got an environment where super bright people have access to these unbelievable tools and know how to use them. I mean, it's almost an unfair fight. And so I worry, I worry yeah. about our government, like just getting so far behind the curve that, you know, the, 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 that they're, they're married to 1930s solutions for healthcare or social welfare or whatever. And back to the making everyone a, a citizen, right? Um, so I had Chris Arnady, uh, the author of Dignity on uh, Infinite Loops. Uh, really, really interesting insights because 
most of the people, there are all these programs, right? That these, uh, the people he interviewed um, who were indigent or down on their luck could avail themselves of, but they didn't. And why didn't they? Well, because they're human beings who have dignity and they didn't want to go in and, and be uh, bitched at and lectured to by some school marm Karen who was going to tell them how they were going to live their lives. And that's my worry about guaranteed basic income. If it takes the power out of the hands of politicians, I don't see it ever actually getting passed. Because if, if I was yeah. going to do it, I would put them on credit cards and distribute them to everyone we've got an address for and, and have them on hand at centers for people who are uh, homeless. Uh, and then they get to make their mind up what that money gets spent on politicians taking their power away from them. Are you kidding me? Yeah, they're never going to be in in favor of that. That's uh, that's not why they but, ran. But so so one thing that we could do that I would be interested in participating in. Why don't we put together a consortium of like really switched on people who've got some money and and try pilot programs where where we give the money and we make it these cards and you know listen i love the united states of america i am long us i will always be long the us and you know it has been incredibly good for me um and my family and so i i don't know let's pay it forward and, and try, experiment because this could be totally wrong right I could get yeah, this totally wrong, but at least you're trying. And there could be a great scam, and you know, I'm sure that the really clever scam folks would like figure out a way to get a hundred of the cards. But but <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm not. I'm, uh, this is, you're gonna have some bad of course, outcomes, well, right? It's not a reason not no, to try. No, exactly, exactly right. And and it's like people get caught up in this this like, you know, they overthink things, and well, well, that can't possibly work because, well. You know, I, I, I'm a rational optimist, which means that, of course, there are going to be future failures. That's a given. It's a given. Yeah. But anyway, you know, you know what I find interesting, Jim, when like I've noticed this a couple of times, people will propose a thought and somebody will jump in with like, of course, that won't work. <laughs> and, it, and it's kind of like, well, the thought isn't necessary. It, it doesn't have to be full or foolproof or whatever in order to to pursue. Like, I'm not saying this is the only potential right. path. I'm just saying maybe we start down this path and then we sort of divert to another one. Right. I mean, imagine imagine when you were young, if you had said, I'm going to write a book and then I'm going to kind of rabble rouse in conferences a little bit. I'm going to get the attention of CNBC and then I'm going to have a firm, right? Uh, most people, I think, would be like, oh, you can't do that. It's like, well, try. I, You know, it's really funny. I experienced that in real time with a friend here in Greenwich. He's uh, like, when I first met him, oh, oh, my first firm, O'Shaughnessy Capital Management, was really hitting its stride. And he's like, we were at dinner together and he's like, you, you you did this without any backers. And I'm like, yeah. And he goes, like, you didn't have any of the banks, like, giving you money? And I'm like, no. And and he's like, <laughs> he goes, I... He, You're telling me you bootstrapped yeah. this? And, and he's like, he's like, that's not possible. And I'm like, Michael, it is possible. <laughs> I, I did it. And and so I, I think, again, that, that gets back to kind of like... Um, you're, you're, are you a, a, a open-minded, expansive thinker, or are you kind of a, 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 a zero-sum type person? And you know, pessimism is very seductive. It's very seductive because it appears to be more sophisticated than optimism, right? And yeah, and it's not. I mean, literally, the book that I recommend to everybody, The Beginning of Infinity by uh, David Deutsch, it's just brilliant around this stuff. And it's like one of the biggest traps that we fall into is we presume to know that we are going to know what future knowledge is. Hmm. We don't. It's like one of his great quotes is, what do you think that physicists were saying about nuclear power or computer people about the internet in 1900. 
And his answer is, they were saying nothing because they didn't know. Yeah, they had, they no, had idea. no idea That's right. that this was going to happen. Yeah. So, But it's a trap. It's a thinking trap, a logic trap that is so easy to fall into. And it's like, you know, it's like whenever I hear people say the science is settled, I know they're trying to sell me something. Yeah, for now. Sci- science is never settled. That, that, I yeah. mean, I'm stealing this from Ryan North, but, you know, he said if, if, if the scientific method had an ethos, it would be pure punk rock anarchy. It's like take nobody's word for it. Uh, nullius yeah. in verba, which is the uh, motto of the uh, scientific society Isaac Newton was a member of. Take no one's word from it and be, be ready to be gleeful about being wrong. Because because yeah. what, what happens is that's how you learn and get better explanations. And and you know, so pessimism though is just it's it seems to be a natural default. Again, I think we're getting back to uh evolution and and look. Jim, I'll tell you what's really intoxicating is certain pessimism. Ah. Right. If you can find somebody that knows what they're saying and they're pessimistic, boy, that's intoxicating. Yeah. That'll drive ratings like crazy. Yes, it will. Because, you know, we look, we're primed to pay attention to um, novel um, uh, problems. And, and by that, I mean novel things that can kill us. And, and so yeah. we, you know, we forget that, like, we're domesticated primates. And, you know, we are animals. Yes, we have this incredible higher function, thank God, brain. And, you know, we're walking around with these quantum computers in our head. And, and yet we also have the, the uh, DNA of uh, primates. And you just have to kind of accept that and work with your limitations and, and then kind of see where that takes you. So uh, can I circle back to your to your early career for a little sure. bit? Um, when you like when you were young and you had the book and you were going to conferences and kind of stirring up, you know, telling somebody I can just build your portfolio and do it better than you. Uh, did you understand like the mental game that you were playing in that scenario or was it just kind of like, I'm going to get attention somehow? Or did you believe it? Like, And I, I don't know that they have to be mutually exclusive. There's almost certainly some overlap. But in order to burst on the scene, sort of like I perceive you did, and then keep the momentum, I mean, were you studying these mental things as a, as a young man? Or is this an interest that you develop later on? Yeah, no, I was studying them as a young man. And um, uh, learning, learning successful ways to get to what your desired outcome was, and and so um, I knew that uh, to break through back then in the '90s when most people didn't know what a factor was, um, I would have to say some pretty aggressive things, and. Um, now I wouldn't have I wouldn't have been as aggressive as I had been if I hadn't also gotten a gig as uh, a consultant, oddly enough, to a big uh, pension plan in the Twin Cities, uh, an old company called Control Data, which was a uh, conglomerate, and those are fun to read about because of how they develop. Anyway, I got hired because I was on the board of the St. Paul Chamber uh, Music Orchestra, and one of my colleagues there was the uh, general counsel for Control Data. We were at lunch, and he's like, mm-hmm. what are you working on? And I told, I told him, you know, I'm cloning. I'm developing a system that I, I think is going to be able to clone money managers and, and see basically how much value they as individuals in their buy-sell decisions are making. And he goes... Are are you, uh, will you? Could we hire you? And I'm like, yeah, sure. <laughs> and and he goes, because you know, as part of all of this consolidation, we've got like eight different managers from four different plans. And you know, back in those days, Bill, it was like 
people honestly didn't know whether someone was a small cap manager, a value manager, right? It, it, the relationships were everything. It wasn't. It wasn't the style. Ah, so you got to peek. I into got to peek was in. Going on. And so what I what I hmm. did was for several years, um, I would uh, uh, get all of the portfolios from the managers. I would put them on a data set. At that time, I was using Value Line. Um, I would look for the most significant deviations from their portfolio in terms of factors uh, from the universe. And then I would use the most significant deviations to build a stock selection model. And hmm. and what we found also kind of underlined my, my uh, moving into full quant uh, was even though we attributed it by the way, these were called at the time normal portfolios because it was uh, a portfolio who's – think of it as an X-ray. So uh, if it was an X-ray, your version of it was a very similar X-ray, right? And and, okay. and so it's not like you, know, you might differ a lot from the S&P 500 or the Russell 3000. This was you differing from your underlying factors, right? And they were, they were the same. Yeah. So they called it a normal portfolio in the literature. They didn't really catch on anyway. Um, even though we attributed massive trading costs to the normal portfolios, what emerged was quite illuminating. My clone portfolios killed the underlying manager. And, and, hmm we had long discussions about why that was happening and what we concluded was they were making bad trading choices and 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 that's led me into wonder why to start looking at when they were trading things and lo and behold they were trading things on bad news uh you know they were selling mm. after the bad news uh you know just not good heuristics to be doing stuff on so I wouldn't have gone out and and kind of made that claim if I didn't have some. I'm I'm a big evidence guy, right? I, I want some evidence uh, to back up a claim that I'm going to make because I, I, you know, anybody can say anything about anything, right? And and if you if if you do that absent evidence, you're just a bullshitter like everyone else. So so because I had that data, I felt very confident in saying that. And this was at a conference that was oriented towards retail investors. And and so they had, you know, this was this was pensions fund stuff. This wasn't, you know, retail at all. Um, but I knew that if I could make some provocative claims and back them up, uh, that people would listen to at least my idea. Hmm. And, you know, it's kind of like you do you want to play in the game or not? And if you want to play in the game, you, you got to put yourself out there and you got to take risks and you got to, you got to be willing to have a lot of people like really angry at you. Uh, and, <laughs> but, but it got a conversation going and uh, you know, I wasn't completely right uh, about everything. Of course, no, no one ever is. Um, but it, yeah, I, so I, I did that in a in a thought out manner uh, because hmm. you, you know if if you don't if you don't come up with a plan to convey your thoughts and ideas uh, in a manner that people are willing to consider them um, you can be the smartest guy in the room I mean I can't tell you the number of times like I've come across I mean geniuses geniuses that built like really incredible uh algorithmic trading systems and it's like well i'll hire i'll hire you but i won't ever yeah, I, I won't right. ever put you in the front room because yeah. you can't communicate i you you have to be able to communicate your ideas and uh, that's why I'm so big on that skill and, and helping people with it. It's why I believe in writing. It's why I believe in putting yourself out there because nobody's going to pay attention if, if you don't, if you can't distinguish yourself. Wasn't that Bezos? Yeah. Was the final line in Bezos thing, distinctiveness, right? 
and and so you but but don't it can't be false that's the thing it's like when i work with young people it's just like no you, you don't have a brand you're you be you yeah. be of use to people and guess what be authentic be of use you'll be fine i guess the only uh you know when you're young the risk is that you may not know exactly who you are. So like sometimes I've encouraged people to do to like be authentically them anonymously. Mm. Right. Because if you kind of blow it, uh, you can reinvent yourself. Yeah. Right. Once you come out as your own handle or whatever on social media, like that's it. It sticks. So uh, be ready for it by the time that you do it is sometimes my advice. Yeah, You know, that's practice. I, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't um, listen, man. I wouldn't want to be a 27 year old guy in this environment right now. I mean, it, it's brutal. It's brutal. In, in if you're doing it under your own name, it's like I have reached a point in my life and my career where, like, uh, you know, and I don't mean this dismissively, but I really don't care what people think about yeah. me. Yeah. And and so it's like. Eh, if I was 27, I bet I'd care. And yeah, and, well, you got your entire earning years and exactly, ahead of you. You better exactly, care, right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. That's right. And so, yeah, why? That's actually not a bad idea. Try it out, uh, and then do it. I am also, though, I'm a big believer in doing things under your own name because that's all in, and you burn the ships. Yeah. It's always been my well. That's why sometimes, sometimes people on Twitter that are anonymous, they're like, "Well, don't judge me by my handle," or you, you, like you can almost tell that they started an account to fight. Yeah, and it's and and then they'll say, "Well, judge me on the ideas," and it's like you're not even standing behind your ideas, man. You just like popped up some <laughs> random account to test something. That's there's no skin in this game. No. You're just some guy or, you know, fem- I think it's more guys than, than females that do it, but maybe that's not right. I know. I think statistically uh, I, speaking on FinTwit, I have a higher probability of being right saying it's a guy. Yes, absolutely. And look, uh, I, I think that, uh, I'm, I'm a big bull on Twitter. Um, and, and, and started to see that light in 2018 and I honestly believe that it, it is going to emerge as the Schnelling point, which is where people who know nothing about and nothing go, <laughs> right? To because everyone else is there. And, and well, something that was amazing, Jim, is I, you know, me and this guy Elliot uh, Turner. He's not some guy. He's an incredible person. This guy. But, uh, <laughs> Yeah, guy. <laughs> he's a great guy. <laughs> yeah, we, um, you know, we had a call with uh, Ned Siegel, who's the CFO, and and I sort of co-hosted with Elliot, and and we had like a truly legitimate distributed buy side call, right on Spaces. Yeah, cool. Anyone could could get into that, right? I didn't even know what callbacks were until pretty recently. I didn't know that the you know the buy side has a lot of these relationships until maybe a year and a half ago. Yeah. And now all of a sudden it's just right there in the open. I think. And it's like, isn't that what Twitter really should be at, it, at its finest moments? That's what it is. Totally. And I also think that Twitter is going to emerge as a global intelligence network. Uh, you need to curate, you need to be ruthless. I tend not to block people, but I, I'm like, if somebody I don't know comes in with some stupid comment, I usually leave that one alone. I never respond. Uh, but then if they come in again with another stupid comment, I mute them. Yeah. And because I, I don't need to block them. Um, and, and you know, people are like, well, what if they're saying nasty things about you? And I'm like, I don't give a fuck. Who the hell are they? <laughs> yeah, it doesn't, I mean, doesn't matter you know, to it me. doesn't matter to me. <laughs> but if you curate right, man, it's powerful. And, and you can get into, so the way I, I think that Twitter is a real time resume, right? So I have a, I have a BA in economics and that BA in economics suggests competence, right? It doesn't guarantee Mm -hmm. it. Whereas the way I see the world going is apps like Twitter are a real time resume that people mm-hmm. like me can watch people. And I heard two people from Twitter, Jamie Catherwood, who you know, 
and and Vatzel, my new colleague at Infinite Loops, um, and like literally, I, I I would never have seen either one of these people without without yeah. Twitter. And I got to watch them work, and I watched the quality of their work. And, and yeah, well, and Jesse Livermore ended up at OSAM, right? And that guy's wicked, wicked smart. smart. And and you know we had uh, uh, Lily. Uh, uh, Funkus, yeah. yeah, no pits lily, yeah, no pits lily. I had that was a great episode, Jim. I'd listen to that like uh, either yesterday or two days ago. That was a great episode. So, uh, the thing that's great about that is like I would never, ever, in in the in the pre Twitter pre internet world, I would never know about her ever. Yeah, and and that's what I love about Twitter. I love these young intelligence man. I I just think. It should be celebrated and we should amplify it and we should like do everything we can to show that we've got this uh, an amazing group of young people. And it doesn't have to be just young people, but an amazing group of young people who are doing really good work. And and now we get to know about it. Right. And yeah. and, and so I, I just find that very exciting. And, and like Batsel. I mean, he lives in a tiny little town outside Bangalore, India. And and hmm. but the the fact is geography doesn't matter anymore. And and like so we've been working together. This guy is a learning machine. He's a he, like we do this, do this, do this, coming up with great ideas for everything. And now all of those guys who are, you know, were were in the past kind of prisoners of geography in a way um yeah doesn't matter anymore doesn't matter anymore yeah well and it's arguably almost a benefit because i mean i i don't know i'm considering whether or not i need help and i know that i can't afford a lot of people in the u.s right well and and that's so. one of my little worries is that um like some some of the younger folks in the u.s they better they better keep their ear to the ground and because they're, yeah. they're going to hear a thundering horde coming towards them. Yeah. That's and, right. and these people are enormously talented and, and they work and hungry and hungry and work their asses off. And, and so, you know, I look, I view it as a good thing. It's like if, if, if a billion people can suddenly get rewarding and interesting jobs uh, that they're really good at. God bless, man. I mean, if, if we can make the the world emerge from poverty, as by the way, it has been. You know, it's like, like, wouldn't it be great if there was just like one station that was just said, "Hey, guess what? Um, in the last ten years, a hundred and ninety thousand people who would have died of dysentery didn't because yeah. because of X, Y, or Z." And it's back to that human programming and 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 the default to pessimism, and and I just think, look, I'm not I'm not Panglossian, right? I, I there's a lot of bad shit going on in the world, uh, but if if we could, I think this new world that's emerging is super exciting. It's giving tools uh, to to people who know how to use them. Um, and giving them leverage, not financial leverage, giving them giving yeah. them leverage to do things that just were undoable, like t ten years ago. I, I love yeah. it. M maybe even three right. years ago. Right at this point, I love it. You know what I like about how uh, we run each other's podcasts is I did not expect to have this conversation at all, but we're just going to go with it and see where it goes. And that's the that's same great. thing that happens when I'm on yours. Um, yeah, yeah. So, I like I like that though. I, I I so I designed mine quite specifically, as you know. It was like uh, I want mine to be. It's so self indulgent, really. But it, it's me. I, I it literally talking to people that I find interesting. Yeah, and and my audience c can self select. I, I don't promote it. I I do on Twitter, obviously, but it's not like we don't take ads. I'm not interested in that. Um, I I don't. I'm not trying to run it like a business. Um, I I intentionally don't look at 
metrics uh, because I'm a competitive person and what gets measured gets managed. And like it would it would upset me if like, I don't know, um, Trent Griffin. Right. So I love Trent. Would yeah. If that episode really... didn't go well or something. Yeah. If yeah. that didn't go well and they're like, don't have this guy on. I don't like this guy. I'm like, fuck you. I don't care if you like that guy or not. I yeah. do. And yeah, I Trent seems can... like a cool dude. He is. He's a really cool dude. Yeah. And he actually he taught me a lot of stuff. And one of the things that he taught me um, was a thing that I never thought about. And I never framed it this way. And as you know, I'm a huge fan of the, the way you perceive things is almost entirely on how it's framed to you. Yeah. And – and and so one of the one of the things that I learned from Trent was that it takes courage to put yourself out there. I I had never like thought about things like that, right? And and it was maybe just kind of like I was lucky and I just was naturally that way. But the more I thought about it, the more I thought, you know what, he's right. It's like it, you, to publish a book or to have a podcast like you have or whatever, if you, or, you know, to take a, a position on some issue that might cause a lot of blowback to be public and, and take that position takes courage. And so I started working that in when I work with other people and, and it resonates with them. They're like, I never, cause they're kind of like me. They're kind of like, I never thought about it that way. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I uh I part of what we went what we talked about in April, right, was uh I I I mean, I wasn't used to anybody paying attention to what I had to say, right? Like in 2019, <laughs> nobody knew who the hell I was. Right. And then all of a sudden, you know, people want to listen or people want me, you know, want to like have my time or whatever and Right. I I mean, I didn't even know how to deal with that and then <laughs> I read, I mean, I there's not there's a couple reviews that uh sting a little bit but but somebody was like this is so self-indulgent and like who talks about their influence growing i was like i don't know man i'm just like thinking out loud uh i'm, I'm sorry i'm not for everybody but I'm just trying to be honest here i i so I, we talked earlier about like when i had this changeover on kind of my mid 30s um so like i never i don't read reviews of anything I do. Um, I, I honestly, I don't care because like, and that sounds kind of like an assholey thing to say because maybe I should, because there might be some good input in there and for me to think about. Uh, so, but I don't, Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'll just be honest. Yeah. Um, and, and, and it's like, you know, the, the like people will get, get me on the phone, right? They're like, uh, Jim, you realize where you are with infinite loops, right? And I'm like, no, actually, I, I don't. And I don't want to know. And they're like, but you, and then they start, right? And there's obviously they're trying to sell me something, right? Yeah. And we can, we can supercharge you. And we can, you know, and I'm like, I'm not interested. Yeah. And it's so interesting for me, because these people are like, they get so flamoxed. And it's like, what do you mean I can't sell you something? What do you mean I can't sell you something? And it's like parts of Twitter that I just love to pay attention to. There's this whole thing called money Twitter that, um, hmm. I, that, you know, it's all the people selling shit, right? Hmm. Like, uh, you know, you too can be fill in the blank. Yeah. Right? It's like Tony Robbins, except they're all little Tony Robbins. Yeah. And, and I like and, Tony, but Tony repackaged a bunch of work and just sold it well. But he yes, kind he of did. admits as much. So that's why well, I mind him. Right. And see, the problem I have with all that, and look, it, it can be really helpful for certain people. But the problem with external motivation, it dissipates yeah. really quickly. Yeah, that's true. And and that's why I like doing things in threads and actually like requiring well, you did it. Like actually requiring people to put some effort in, yeah. Because because the only one, the only person that can change you, Bill, is you, Bill. That's it. Yeah. And 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 so can I be helpful? Hopefully, maybe. 
Um, if, if what I say or suggest resonates, maybe, maybe I can. So it's like, I, I have no urge to change other people. I, I, I want to help them. And that's why I do all like, I had a good friend, like, why are you bothering man? I mean, like, why aren't you just like in the Caribbean? <laughs> yeah. Well, cause you like and, it. I like it. I love it. It's <laughs> like, I've always, it's, it's, it's always been one of my underlying things that I, I think playing fields should be level. And, and if I can level a playing field, that makes me feel good. Dude, and, I'll tell you something that was really cool of you is when you opened up, I think it was your opener was with Liz, right? Yeah. That was awesome. And like, nope, it's Lily and you put me on. Uh, I mean, I think it's really cool how you're trying to find young talent on Twitter and give them a shot. I think that's awesome. I well, hope thank I'm you. doing stuff like that when I'm, I'm a little bit older because I think that like that would give me a sense of... I'm talking about me as if I'm you right here, right? But like that would give me a sense of fulfillment and like I'd want to get up and do that stuff. It's really there are fascinating conversations you get to have. Yeah, and you know the way I look at it is it's just like if I can if I can use my platform to introduce the world to really cool thinkers, sometimes unusual thinkers, sometimes uh you know just people who don't fit into that box, right? Um, I love that. I love yeah. that because it's just like we we are so lucky. We live in like the richest country in the world at the richest time in the world. And like I always tease people who are like, you know, capitalism sucks. And I, and I and 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 it's like I I I always I always like put up a it's thing. The best that, thing we got. Yeah, I always put up a thing like um uh, uh, they tweet it from their iPhone while getting a Starbucks. <laughs> yeah. Well, so here's a good question. I mean, how many jobs have you created in your career? Do you think? Oh, wow. I've never even, I've never even considered that. Um, hundreds, certainly. That's amazing. Uh, and you yeah. built an enduring organization that you were able to give to your son who is mad competent. Like, that's awesome. Yeah, I think it's great. I mean, if I were so, you and somebody said capitalism sucks, I'd be like, you go fucking do it. <laughs> yeah, I, well, I, I rather, I, it's more fun for me to tease him. I know, but I'm just saying, like, that's really, really cool. Like, yeah, what, well, thank you. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I've been incredibly lucky in my life and and I never a day goes by that I don't say thank you. It's like I won the cosmic lottery and the odds against me are so astronomical that it's basically a null set. And yet here I am. Yeah. And so it's kind of like, uh, you know, all of us, honestly, all of us are the result of millions of years of success. Of, of, of your ancestors mating, producing offspring, living, and they, and they doing it, and so on, and so on, and so on, and until we get to us. So, I mean, that's not a trivial thing, man. The, yeah. the, the, the odds against existence are so huge. And, and so my whole thing is, it's like I, I'm, I read a lot of like, um, uh, seeker stuff. I, I hesitate to call it spiritual because it's really not. It's not spiritual. Uh, but like, I just have this overwhelming desire to know about everything. And and so one of the things that I find really interesting is just this idea that the the the. the just the the joy you should have of being alive and being alive now, right? It's like every time I take a shower, I like say thank you because I, I contemplate the idea that for 99% of human beings who've ever lived on this planet, they never had a hot shower. Yeah. And Yeah, it's nuts and, when you start thinking about how lucky just day-to-day -day life is. 
Oh, it's incredible. It's incredible. And so it's like back to the seeker stuff. It's like, so I'm not religious. I'm, I'm not an atheist because I think that requires as much faith as, as yeah, it does kind of de- in a different way. Devout, right. Yeah. Well, cause it's a, what you're saying is I know there is no God. Really? Oh, cool. You, can you give me some proof for that? Or yeah. is there any hypothesis that has it, that we it is, makes it falsifiable? No. Yeah. Have you talked and to so, Brent B. Sure. Cause he's got a pretty <laughs> yeah. compelling document. Yeah. So Brent's great. Exactly. But so for me, I'm, I'm, I'm an agnostic. I, I have an open mind about the way the world works, the way the universe works. I think it's a lot weirder than everyone thinks it is. Yeah. But, but so a lot of people who do this get, get to this place, and, and I call it they reach the bridge of nihilism because they, they go through all of the um, uh, sanctioned belief systems like Christianity, Judaism, Islam, you, you fill in the blank, Hindu, um, and, and they find them wanting. And, and, they're, and what, what drives them crazy is life has no purpose, right? They, there is no, I mean, like, there's no answer, right? That y- the purpose of life is, you know, this. Yeah. And, and, and so they, I see a lot of people get very nihilistic about it. And like, I go the other way, man. I say, okay, so if life has no meaning, what does that mean? It means that I get to create the meaning in my life. In other words, I get to just, I get to choose my own adventure. Yeah. And, and I, and I, and I get to like, uh, uh, make the meaning in my life. And, and so when you, Again, framing. Framing is so important. If you frame it that way, all of a sudden you're like, I mean, why wouldn't you just be like waking up almost every day thinking, God damn, what another great day. Yeah, this is awesome. (laughs) Yeah. So, I mean, it's uh, it's a life philosophy that uh, took me a while to get to, uh, you know, because I was like when I was in my early 20s, I was, you know, I, I was more Nietzsche than Nietzsche. <laughs> how did like, kids, how did having kids change you? So, um, I assume it did. I, I don't know anyone that it hasn't changed, which is why I so, asked that way. Uh, of course it did. Um, I was the, I'm the youngest in my family and, uh, by nine years. And so I, I, from a young age, I was changing my nephews and nieces. Hmm. Uh, so I was surrounded by little kids. Um, and I always knew that I wanted kids. And so I got married. Uh, today's my anniversary, for example. Oh, uh, happy anniversary. Uh, th- thank you. 39 years. We got married when we were 22. And we were kind of like, all right, we're insane to get married so young. Let's have children young. Um, hmm. And and my and, and <laughs> when we were talking about it, I, I said to my wife, you know, I want to like the same music as my first child, which is Patrick. Um, and so I was 24 when Patrick was born. And um, so how did it change? Me? That's crazy, uh, man. Yeah. So, so you're, and, and, you're trying and, to start a firm and you have Patrick. And then oh, my Kate, goodness. And then Lael. Um and I, I, I will remember I got hired by Merrill Lynch as the first outside consultant to design a unit investment trust, which most people won't know what that is. It's a fixed portfolio that expires after a year. Uh, but they'd never hired an outside company before, and c- company meaning me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I, I still remember doing um, – my wife was in labor in Greenwich Hospital, and I'm on a payphone – doing a conference call for Merrill Lynch. Oh, she must have loved uh, that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, She really was. Does it still come up? It (laughs) It might come up tonight. (laughs) Occasionally. Occasionally. (laughs) But but, so I guess the first thing that I like really learned, like moments after, uh, and I was present when Patrick was born. um, And, you know, because that was a trend that was – 
getting started and I want to take full advantage of. Um, anyway, so I cut his cord. I took him in my arms and I understood immediately what unconditional love was. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that was like, like really kind of blew me back because it was, um, I, I was lucky in that my mother loved me unconditionally. And, and I always say, if you got one parent that you get unconditional love from, you're probably going to be okay. Yeah. Um, and, um, so I was able, I, I had been thinking about it, but when that feeling, speaking of emotions, right, when that feeling hits you and you actually feel it, it's like, and I remember when Patrick got married and uh, Lauren, his wife was pregnant with my grandson, Pierce, I said, Patrick, remember what I told you, you are not, you, when your child is born, we didn't know that it was a boy at the time, when your child is born, you will know how much I love you. Yeah. And, that's what my dad and, said to me. And I think when I held my first, I think I got what he said. You really do, man. Yeah. And it's, it's just like, again, it's just baked into our DNA. And, and, you know, Steven Pinker does it. There's a great book called the blank slate in which he talks about, you know, one of the, one of the first things that organized religions try to do is, separate children from their parents huh and the reason they do that is because they know that those the what's bred in the bone the blood wills out over everything hmm. and and so they if they want if they want to shape and mold the child they want that child not to not to be under the purview of the parent Hmm. And and so you understand kind of why when you have your own kids and I I've ne let's put it this way too I've talked about uh, this with a lot of people I've never had someone say to me that they didn't immediately have that feeling yeah Ever. I remember when my kid opened his eyes it was like the, my entire world changed I I oh. can feel it right now just even talking about it I was sitting in the chair and I was looking down at him his little eyes opened I was like alright that's it this kid has me <laughs> totally totally and you know, I mean again the, it's the like one of those great things in life the continuing to love unconditionally is difficult yeah it is and I can't imagine uh, it gets easier <laughs> so it doesn't. Um, and that's one. So I would recommend um, one of these seekers called Anthony DeMello, who's a, he's dead now, unfortunately. Um, he was an Indian who was a Jesuit priest, kind of weird combination. Uh, but he essentially gained enlightenment from a rickshaw driver in uh, Calcutta. Uh, which itself is a really interesting story. But one of the things you learn when you read him is that one of the central things you've got to do is shed attachments. And and the one that I had the biggest struggle with was DeMello basically saying, somebody asked him, do you mean family too? And he goes, yeah, I do. Hmm. And and I was offended when I first read that. But then when I read his explanation, I understood better what he meant. He's not telling you to, to um, like, say, yeah, I'm not dealing with you anymore, family. It's, in fact, quite the opposite. What he's telling you is if you're making anything in your relationship with your wife or your husband or your child conditional, Hmm. That that's bad. It's bad yeah. for you and it's bad for them. And so he's got this wonderful thing. I actually put it up on Twitter because I thought it was like really awesome. And I wrote it to my wife because I believe it. And that is, I love you, but that, that means that 
I have to let you pursue what you want to do in your life. That means I have to let you have your interests and they may not be the same as mine. Yeah. And 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 it got me thinking about the whole kind of conditionality, the quid pro quos, right? And and fine, in arm's length um negotiations or business partnerships or things like that, fine, right? I mean, like you don't want to keep doing business with somebody who's not doing their part of the deal. Yeah. But in 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 matters of love and matters of the heart, this idea of being able to shed those what I now understand are bad attachments, I think is critical. And you know, it's interesting because I I have kind of had that all that idea all my life. Like I had a recurring dream uh, that started and I, of course, me being a lunatic, I keep a dream journal um, that hmm. goes all the way back to when I was 19. And anyway, right about when Patrick was uh, about to be born, I started having this dream about being on a beautiful boat, a yacht. And, and we were sitting on the back of it and we were kind of just cruising around. And there was a woman who... Apparently, I knew in the dream, <laughs> but in in the in between us was this vase that I had, that was quite beautiful, and it was in glass case, you know, really locked down and everything. And she just kept going on about this vase, right? She was like, "I love this vase. This vase is so incredible. This is the most beautiful vase I've ever seen in my life." And in the dream, I look at her and I go, "Take it. It's yours." And she's like, "I." I, I could never do that. I, that I, that's too much. And I'm like, well, y you seem to love it much more than I do. Hmm. Um, and why don't why don't why don't you have it then? And she's like, no, I, I will not take it. I said, are you sure? And she's like, yeah, I'm positive. And I said, there's nothing I can do to convince you to take that face. And she's like, no, there's nothing you can do. So I take the glass off of it. I crack the vase on the back of the boat and throw it in the ocean. Huh. And so... And this is a, a recurring of, dream that you had? Yeah. That's interesting. And and so uh, when you think about it, 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 it's interesting, right? It's like... It, things are just things, right? The, yeah. The only, Where were you in your career at this? Just to, I'm just trying to frame like what I, maybe I, was going on in your mind. Like, what are you okay smashing? What does the vase represent? Yeah. So in my career, I was still in the deep research part. Okay. Um, of doing everything that ultimately became my first and second book. Um, and I am naturally an extrovert, uh, but. I have no problem being alone for long periods of time. And I, I had a little small office uh, that was about a half a mile walk from my house. Um, and I went there every day early and I stayed, you know, until dinner time. Um, and I was completely alone. Uh, and I love classical music. I love Bach in particular. So I would just like stick on Bach um, and work all day long work. and study. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. So hmm. who knows? My recurring dream is my teeth fall out. It's not quite as deep <laughs> as smashing a vase. <laughs> when I wake up and I'm like, oh, thank God I have teeth. <laughs> you know, happens that's a all the common, time. I hate that, it. <laughs> that, that is a very common dream. Oh, you do it drives that, me right? insane. Yes. Yeah. So I can like feel them disintegrate <laughs> in the middle of the night. Fuck this again. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> So what are you building in infinite loops that you need uh, like analysts and whatnot? What's going on in the mind of Jim O'Shaughnessy? So infinite loops ultimately, I hope, will become the, uh, the place where people meet super interesting people that they might never have heard of. Um, uh, you know, I'm going to continue to have people who are well known on as well like Rory Sutherland and, and, and guys like that, um, like Tim Irvin, Wait But Why. Um, yeah, that was know, a great my, episode. He's a smart dude, and we're doing a live event 
Um, and um, listen, I like talking to smart people and hearing what they have to say because I find them fascinating. And then Alex Danko, who's my recurring guest. I, I think he's a hoot, man. And like, uh, I just love talking to him. And you know, as you know, everything is unscripted. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I don't even tell people what we're going to talk about, literally. And and so I want what I'd really love is for people to self-select who want to listen to that kind of stuff. And and I want them to feel like they got to pull up a chair at the dinner table where me and my guests are talking about stuff. Yeah. And 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 then we're going to do we're going to start to do some series Oh, cool. um, yeah, so we're, we're planning one right now uh, on this whole great reshuffle and, and what we think is going to happen. Um, and uh, so that's going to be fun. Uh, we're, we might expand into um, YouTube video land um, against my desires and wishes. Yeah. Uh, I'm very but, conflicted on this myself. Yeah. I'm inclined not to show this video. I kind of like really? the audio only product. Yeah. I l- listen, so do I. And 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 but again, I'm a data guy at the end of the day. Yeah. And so I did a deep dive and man, YouTube has like just massive fans. Yes, they it just does. love everything YouTube. They love to see people's expressions and and i get that that doesn't that's not my way you want to know my real reason i don't want to do it jim why because there are some episodes that some people have said like i'd like to come on but i may need drinks right or something like that (laughs) and i don't want the audio only version to be like uh, oh this person was drinking you know i want it to be (laughs) random enough that uh, people great. are allowed to do whatever the hell they want on here, but not so, like, you know, take career risk. Right. Well, you're thoughtful. You know, the first one I ever did, I did with ramp. Right. Yeah. And, and we did it in, in person. And yeah, we Dan did it, was there. Wasn't Dan there? Yes. Because yeah, and you guys Dan, would take tequila shots. No, 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 no. Ramp was taking tequila okay. shots. Okay. We were all, we were all on the clock. It was a, it was a work day for us. Okay. Uh, Ramp was on vacation, ah. and and so uh, and we've become really good friends since then. But um, this was my first meeting of him. He turns up late, uh, and it was at a really nice club in Manhattan. And so we had this really cool room and everything. And <laughs> he's when, ripping uh, shots. He's ripping shots, <laughs> and it's like, and it's like, of course I'm gonna let him do that. Yeah. And so the the waitress comes in and I'm like, yeah, see this guy over here, this lanky tall guy. Yeah, bring him four double tequilas and put oh, them nice. all in front of him. <laughs> and so it was so funny because like literally he was drunk. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> and 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 he, the the fun of it, of course, was he got funnier. He got a lot funnier. Yeah. Uh, and and what people don't know about Ramp is he's a very smart guy. And well, yeah, and you can't build that and not be smart. It's impossible. Yeah, no, you can't. Well, I also have the thing. I um, if if somebody is incredibly funny, they have to be smart because yeah, that makes sense. Uh, because you because really good humor requires your ability to see the incongruities of a situation. And, and also to, um, you know, to, to bring those kinds of things up. It's just, I've never met, let's put it this way. I know a lot of comics. My youngest daughter, uh, was a stand up comic for a while. Um, and I've never met an unsmart comic. Hmm. Um, and I've, and I've met some really big names. Um, and I mean, I haven't met him. But like, just look at Chris Rock's eyes, and they dazzle. This guy is so smart. It's, his eyes are just like on fire with with intelligence. And- I mean, the amount of times that I quote the stuff that he said, like, like I, people ask me about how do you stay married? Married, you know? 
And yeah. I, my mind automatically goes to him being like, you got to marry the crust of the motherfucker. Like you, you don't get to just eat the sandwich, the middle. Like you gotta like the crust. It's so. True. I'm like, that's it. That's it's actually so the right true. stuff. And then, you, and then when he goes on and on about somebody bragging about getting a job, you're supposed to have a that's, job. Yeah. The the first time I saw, it, I think it was Bring the Pain, the one where he was talking about OJ and stuff. I, oh. I had my. So this is how that night went. I lose a tennis match to my buddy Jimmy Gubitosi and we're staying at my grandma's house in Vermont. I get in the car and I'm like super pissed off and my grandma farts and my <laughs> grandfather, my grandfather looks at me and he's like, great. So on top of being a pleasure to be with, you go and fart. And I couldn't like out my grandma, my grandma and Jimmy and I are all laughing in the car because we know what actually happened. We go get ice cream and we're come back. We're still giggly. And then we turn that like Jimmy and I turn that on and I'd never seen anything like that. And I came into it in sort of a happy mood anyway. Yeah. I, I mean, we cried the whole night laughing like it was that was the most amazing comedy I think I've ever seen. It's probably there close is- to the first time people saw Eddie Murphy. Right. Yeah. Like I, I didn't even know what to expect. So I, I had the opportunity to actually meet and have dinner with after seeing his show, Martin Short. And this guy is like, I mean, he is just another example. This guy's mind is so fast. Yeah. And, and, and what he does better than a lot of people is he just lampoons the hypocrisy of the uh, entertainers. And, and like, he, he's just like really, really funny. And I love, listen, I love funny people because I think that humor um, is uh, a way to, to get some truths out there, I guess, that you couldn't like if you weren't funny. Yeah. And, and so. Is this how you look at memes too, sir? Oh, yeah. So, yes, it is. Um, I do have alternative. I never know when you give me a meme, I'm like, is Jim giving me approval or disapproval? There's certain (laughs) ones that I think can go either way. And then I sit there and I think for a little bit. I'm like, I know he's trying to tell me something, but I don't know what it is. So, so I am fascinated by, um, the, the, uh, weapons grade nature of memes. Um, and, um, the mimetic behavior that they engender. Um, and I think I, you know, I'm, I'm not giving anything away to say that more than half of what I do on Twitter is an experiment and I'm building a data set. Um, I just don't know what this data set is for, but one day when you take (laughs) over the world, I'll be like, oh, well. He was hacking the neural network, of course. It's OSAM so, part two. <laughs> so, so I am very interested in the fact that um, for the most part, people are very visual, uh, but they also want to be entertained. And, and so I run my Twitter account uh, basically in, in thirds. So a third of my stuff is serious. In other words, it's like these threads that I do and, and like I, I do the quotes, the two thoughts from quote every day. Um, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll do other quotes, uh, as well. Um, and threads. So that's kind of the, the serious part. Um, I will, I enjoy having like conversations, uh, on the open timeline about interesting things like, Somebody was earlier today, it was like, you know, did we discover math or did we invent math? Mm. Um, And and I find those kinds of things really interesting. Um, And then the other part is entertain, but entertain and and send a little bit of a message at the same time that you're doing that. And and so the 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 whole GIF and meme thing was me studying symbols actually I, I know this is a real letdown but um 
I, the power of symbols in human society. And um, they are unbelievably powerful. Yeah, well, it's what politics has become, it seems like. Yep. And and so what even I'm masks trying... became a symbol in a way. Yeah. And and which is crazy to me. But anyway, it's like it is what it is, and that means I'm gonna study it. Yeah. And and so the ulterior motive is that so all of the kind Hang of Hang on, wait, I think I just got an insight. This might not be an insight to other people, but do you think that part of why you're a factor investor and also interested in this is you enjoy the study of like group psychology? Oh, totally. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I guess I knew that, but the the two just like linked up in my head. I am fascinated by human beings and yeah. by what what drives us and I think that um if if I build my uh, mental models, which I hate using the term because it gets overused, but it's a good term. If if I can continually improve by deletion and addition my mental models, uh, that's good for me. And um, you know, uh, the the truth ought to indicate that you're right about something. And 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 so. I I am ruthless in terms of uh, stripping away something that the, the doesn't lead me to the right conclusion, right? And and so I always want to learn about those and human interaction, mimetic desire, all these things that I'm really interested in. You know, began with my fascination with the stock market because listen. Uh, the stock market's the Olympics of business as far as I'm concerned. And it's like, um, mm. you know, there's just so, there's just so much going on and, and, you know, it, to understand it and to, to be able to build models that directionally are correct um, and, and do well over time. That's like really cool for me. And human psychology is really a massive part of that but so the what i was going to say is i'm sure that there will be innovations in um, traditional factor research right but i think it's been really heavily mined um we're all using the same data set which is the crisp going back and the CompuStack going back to 64. We actually, for a while, were building a data set using um, old Moody's manuals that were being translated by a team in Africa uh, that we were going to actually be able to uh, build factor models back to the tw early 20s. Um, but we kind of stopped when we got some of the data, uh, like price to book, for example. And yeah, it was, a, it was exactly what we would have predict it. Hmm. And, and, and the second thing is that I, it's not that I'm not interested in those financial models. I am, but they, they, they've been durable. In other words, um, the, 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 for the most part, things make sense. Uh, now, does that mean that you cannot evolve your model? Well, yeah, you better like price to book. Price to book became less and less relevant as the economy moved more and more to brand value. Um, and, um, you know, certain diet in the wool types stick with it and we dropped it just because it's not working well anymore. And, and for reasons that we understand, right? Yeah, it seems like it's... Um... It's an old world sort of way to look at though. It's it's yeah. great for manufacturing businesses, I guess. Yeah, is how we I'd don't, sort we of don't, put it. We're, we're, not, we're not making real widgets anymore. We're making digital widgets. And but my point was going to be that uh, so we've done we've gotten as much data, financial data, uh, on stocks as I think anyone. We've tested our stuff in every market that for which we have data. Um, and one, I mean, one of the things that we found is kind of like, 
the the really unglamorous thing is you're going to get much better results if you are like draconian about cleaning the data. And that's very unglamorous. And yet it's what my guys do because it makes a huge difference. But what I'm looking at now is probably going to be using different tools like hmm. machine learning, for example. Um, I have a thesis that I've had since I was 27. And now we can finally test it because machine learning is going oh, to be able cool. to test it. Um, it's got to be pretty exciting. It is exciting. I can hardly wait, man. It's yeah. going to be awesome. Um, but it's like, you know, that original high that I got when doing the original What Works on Wall Street, it's like I, it, I, had, I, I had to walk the data by hand because – the program that they said worked <laughs> did not work. And and so I did it all in Sanskrit um, <clears throat> or early um, uh, computer language um, and literally did it year by year. And so for like three years in a row, I was the best error finder for CompuStat uh, because it was all, I mean, when you see the errors, it's like, wow. Um, the other thing I did after our last conversation is I ordered a, a notepad of grid paper so that mm -hmm. I can write down by hand everything because of what you said. I was like, all right, I'm doing this by hand. I'm done. Yep. I'm done relying on Excel. It may sound silly, but I'm going to catch the errors and my mind's going to actually know what's going on. And it works. It yeah. is so it's amazing when you when you get into that and you really are doing it that laboriously the hard way you learn so much and you just see all of the errors and you know there in in the fourth edition of what works it's like i included a long reference to uh the Macquarie paper a guy did this paper basically saying oh yeah you know all that data that you think you've got the most comprehensive data set in the world yeah it doesn't cover 50 percent of the stocks that we're trading um mm -hmm. during that time period so my point being that will will there be a continued evolution in uh, you know the traditional quant approach to the market? Yeah, probably. Uh, will, will it get augmented by things like machine learning? Almost certainly. Um, but the things that I'm looking for in this new thing, and this takes this is uh, takes a little while, but so. I've always defined the stock market as a complex adaptive system with feedback loops. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, under normal conditions, markets clear, right? In that opinions are heterogeneous. In other words, Bill might be buying Apple and Jim might be selling Apple, but we both have legitimate reasons for doing that. You're buying it for your three young kids. I'm I'm by I'm selling mine because I want to uh, pay for my grandson's education. Whatever, but yeah. th these are, these are reasonable reasons to both buy and sell, and our opinions are different, and that's why markets work so well. However, there are anomalous times where, that some have called black swans, that others have called, you know, uh, glitches and in the underlying system where whereby information cascades begin to happen hmm. and when these information cascades happen they move participants opinions to homogeneity in other words everybody's thinking the same thing now the these these things happen under different duration regimes they can be short medium or long term OK, and so I believe that the very definition of a black swan is something that you can't predict. Right. But that does not preclude being able to confirm a black swan has occurred. Big, small, medium or large. OK, so, you know, take when oil went to negative. Right. Yeah. Uh, that was a black swan. Um, you know, global financial crisis, black swan. 
Um, and I believe that through a, a, an intensive machine learning iteration that we're working on right now, we are we are probably going to be able to test this hypothesis. And 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 the the hypothesis is black swans can be confirmed hmm. early. Hmm. And you don't have to be too bright to understand that if you have ooh, four months ahead uh, start on trading, either long or short, a black swan. Yeah, you should be. Uh, that's a nice edge. You, that 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 should be a nice little edge that you're going to have. Huh. And so, I. But you know, so that's my hypothesis. It's be, it's it's been updated, you know, because I didn't know about machine learning in 1987 when I was talking about this. But the nature of complex adaptive systems, you have to understand, is that everything emer that em is emergent from a complex adaptive system comes from the bottom, not from the top. Right. Mm. That's, that's why. Yeah. You can't plan it as much. It's uh, it just kind of exactly. happens. Exactly. And, and you, and so I have, I just think that I have the right uh, mental uh, framework to be it. So, so I had um, one of our, uh, uh, one of our other, OSAM research partners, a uh, really nice guy who's a data uh, a machine learning specialist. We recorded a uh, podcast with him yesterday. And like he was the first guy that I was like talking to about this. And, and he's like, it's really fascinating. And, and then I asked him a question. I'm like, I have a theory that normal people, um, and I'm thinking of young Frankenstein and I have Abby normal as my brain. Um, normal people rebel a little at, at AI or machine learning in that even if it can tell you when and why, because it can't tell you how, mm. not, sorry, it can tell you when and how it can't tell you why. Okay. Right. Yeah. And, and we are such narrative based creatures that. I've noticed because I ask a lot of people about this. I'm like, hey, would you be cool if I could tell you that this was going to happen? It was going to happen for this amount of time, but I couldn't tell you why. And yeah, I that wouldn't tell sit you, well with most people. I don't know that that'd sit well with me, but I'll tell you what, if I could make money on it, I'd be fine. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so anyway, I have no, I have no problem with that. Yeah. And, and so, like, but I also go into this assuming that the null hypothesis will win. In other words, I'll be wrong that, yeah. that you, you can't confirm uh, a black swan. But it's this is the kind of research that I'm finding exciting right now. Um, and it's a whole different way of looking at markets. Um, because, as you know, we are we've been doing a lot of venture through O'Shaughnessy Family Partners, which is our family office. We've been doing a lot of venture style investing and, and Patrick uh, O'Shaughnessy Asset Management owns Positive Sum, which is our venture capital division, uh, but Patrick runs it. So, you know, he's the general partner. Um, but we also think that this kind of way of looking at the way markets emerge and the way stuff emerges uh, is going to be more useful on the machine learning AI side. And by the way, we we don't think that any of it's magic. Um, it's Kevin, who I had on yesterday, was like he was the first guy who was when he came up to Connecticut um, to do a day long seminar for us, which was awesome. And I, like the he opened with the line, "Anything that you have heard from an AI marketer is wrong and it's bullshit." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah. he level set us really well. And 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 then and then he gave us the real skinny on how it works, and it's really cool how it works. Huh. Um, and it's only getting cooler. You know, we have the vaccine because AI. We couldn't fold protein, piece of cake for them. 
um, and things like uh, chess by just by just putting in the the rules of the game and not other games, they found that was the best thing to do. In other words, just let the machine figure out how to play the game. Yeah, and and so um, we we are fortunate in that we have access to like some really wicked smart people being able to help design this. But I kind of I kind of think that that's the next. I, you know, I'll keep most of my money, my public money in OSAM strategies, obviously. Um, you know, I love our micro cap strategy. It was so funny. You know, people are always like, they think I'm bullshitting them when I say that I don't look at my portfolio. I, I really don't look at my portfolio. Yeah, well, and, that's, that's and, when you're really actually confident in it. Yeah. And so, but the, the funny thing was, so somebody was, was talking about micro cap stocks and we have a micro cap strategy. Which, which I love and I put a lot of money in. And, and so I don't know why it came up, but for the first time in like a year, I went and actually looked at how it had done. And it was up like 79% in a year. And I called Patrick and I'm like, did you know that this was? And he goes, of course I knew. <laughs> <laughs> yes, dad, go back to doing your podcast thing. Yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm yeah, watching... Like Everything. I, I got it. Thank I, you. <laughs> well, and, you know, and, and that's it. And the other fun thing that like I am all in on is our canvas uh, platform, uh, customized, uh, customized uh, portfolios. Like I tried it with Netfolio in the 90s and the tech wasn't there and I wasn't smart enough to like get it just right. But I we built up all of the software because I was a software freak. And I, and I just didn't want any off the shelf software. Hmm. And we rolled, we rolled out of Bear Stearns in right into the great financial crisis. And, and so like I said to the president of my company, Chris Lovelace, I'm like, dude, we're not going to sell a long only portfolio for three years. We know that let's not, let's not try and delude ourselves and pretend that everyone's going to just snap back. And I said, so. So, so let's spend the next three years building, getting rid of every, I want to pull out every commercial off the shelf piece of software hmm. and I, and I want it built for our separately managed accounts. Well, th- so Patrick is looking at all this and he's enamored of AWS and he comes into my office and he sits down and he goes, dad, yeah, we, we built the Death Star to kill a mouse. And I'm like, what do you mean? And he's like. Our technology is like, you know, we go through these do really deep due diligences by the big uh, p- firms and, and consultants that hire us. And I'm not going to name any names, but we have heard the comment from more than one of them. Your technology is like literally better than asset management shops 100 times your size. Hmm. And, and so and so we... Patrick gets the idea. Let's let's customize. Let's give let's repurpose this tool and and give advisors the power to give their clients exactly what they want. And what does that mean? Well, it means like if you work at Google and you got a big slog of Google stock, we can do nearest neighbor analysis to the entire universe and not buy any stock whose factor profiles are really close to Google. Uh, yeah, we can so also you get, tax, like, diversification we, for real. We we can also tax manage your position and generate, uh, you know, between depending on how the year goes, between fifty and one hundred and ten basis points of tax alpha. Hmm. Um, if if you want a real ESG, don't buy anything off the shelf, man, because there's a lot of crap in there, and like we have fifty four levers you can pull. And, and so it, you can design it right down to you. And, and I was rereading, um, so Peter Drucker, uh, you know, the management guru, mm-hmm. I've, re- I've read all of his books, but the book that he wrote that I liked the most was this book called Adventures of a Bystander. And it was about his mm-hmm. life. And I highly recommend it. I think you'd love it because this guy just like got to meet like some of the most fascinating people in the world. Yeah, that's and, cool. And, and 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 one of the one of the stories is when he was working for a small merchant bank 
in London in the 1930s. And, you know, it's really funny. He's got a good sense of humor. But when when he's talking about the way they actually managed money for these wealthy clients, I, I was like to Patrick, this is what Canvas can do for everybody. Hmm. I mean, it was it was it was designed for that particular client. And now we can do that and like in in uh not even two years we've added nearly two billion dollars to that platform new money wow and 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 the other thing that i think is really cool about it is it's also given us a way to put behavioral biases on the investor's side Hmm. now how, how do we do that well there's this thing called the ikea effect which is if you have anything to do with like the construction of your portfolio and and, and by that i mean like maybe we, we had my friend howard Lindzen, um uh we we did what we called the howie 495 because he only wanted to remove five stocks from the s p that he really hated um anyway even if that's all you do people will stick to a portfolio yeah because it's longer. theirs Yes. Yeah, for and, sure. That and, makes sense. And, and so I like so I'm wildly bullish on that. And I I just think it'll that's gonna be the way money gets managed. Um, if you're working with an advisor and you know, it might even end up becoming a retail product too, just because again, the tech is there and why not? So Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, a lot of cool, exciting stuff going on. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to let you get out for your anniversary, but I do want to ask one question on behalf of Jen Ross. Ah, Jen uh, Ross. I, I said, do you have any questions for Jim? And she said, he's all about reversion to the mean with the market going straight up. What does he think that will look like when it, when reversion happens, a sharp drop, a slow chick trickle. Is there any escape? She presupposes that there's a, a reversion coming in the question. So yeah. you can, uh, you yeah. can assert something different than the assumption that she makes, but right. so, that's her question. Yeah. A natural so Jen, short seller's question. Yes. Jen, <laughs> Jen, Jen is great. I love Jen. Um, and um, so, yeah, there probably will be reversion to the mean and it will coincide with the Fed trying to normalize their policies. And the minute money costs something again, um, it would not surprise me in the least to see a lot of holy fuck. Um, yeah. uh, I, 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 I better start actually paying attention to companies that have real cash flows. And, and so, you know, do I know when that'll happen? No, I don't. Yeah. Nobody don't, does. I, right. I, yeah, I don't. I don't know how long the Fed will maintain this posture. They've kind of they've kind of painted themselves into a corner, and so we'll see. At some point, they're going to have to, right? Because it, there's there's a reason why they call economics the dismal science, um, and and when that happens, that'll be the catalyst. Would be my guess, and uh, yeah, but. To all the young people who are listening, bye, 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 man. Yeah. I mean, because <clears throat> if, if if you get an opportunity to buy stocks 50% off and like you're 35 years old, I mean- That's how you get wealthy. That's how you get, exactly. That's how you yeah. get rich. Yeah. So- The unfortunate part of the policy, at, at least as I see it, and I have a pea brain, so I could be wrong, but- um, it, it furthers a lot of the the problems in society that we have, right? And those that are wealthy don't have to, you know, they benefited off this bounce and, you know, forward returns are lower. That only that doesn't really actually impact them that much, but uh, it really kills the people that are trying to grow wealth. So I, I would welcome a uh, correction as long as uh, I can avoid lifestyle creep. You know, uh, just finally, that's another one of my little hobby horses. It's like... Um, this whole idea that some people have that you're not allowed to speak on that because you're rich or you're this or you're that. What they don't understand is uh, 
super huge tax increases aren't going to affect me. Uh, I mean, I'm set. I can, I can like retire if I want. And who they're going to fuck up are young people like you who want to make something of their life. And, and so their thinking is just so not clear. <laughs> they, 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 they don't really understand that the, the, the people they're hurting the most are the young people who want to, you know, want to build some wealth for their family and, and, and want to succeed. And uh, you know, they're not hurting me. They're not, they're not hurting Bill Gates. They're not hurting, yeah. you know. Yeah, Buffett's going to be fine. Buffett's going to be just fine. Yeah. And and so, you know, it's this this urge to punish, I just find so, um, like, unevolved. Do and, you think it stems a little bit from, like, not wanting to own whatever portion of your own situation is your own? Like, it seems to me, and I say this as somebody who has said every single benefit in the world so i get it but um a lot of it's like a lack of ownership in in a lot of outcomes a a lot of the anger that i see is kind of like well i'd like to know how much of that self-inflicted or community inflicted versus sort of who you're blaming yeah i i don't know i don't know the answer i i do know that if you manage to retain your agency um you don't think like that yeah and and um, again, I am just stunned by the amount of bright, amazingly smart young people that I am able to interact with and and hopefully, you know, uh, amplify. Um, there's so many. And it's like at some point you, you just you you, you got to understand that if you're always going to be blaming somebody else, you're can have a shitty life and yeah. i don't i don't want anyone to have a shitty life i want everyone to have a great life well i can tell that by the way that you're a mentor to the younger people myself included and uh you know i i appreciate you taking all this time to talk to me and uh and more than when the mic's on i appreciate you taking the time when the mic's off and it's been a, a relationship that i cherish and uh I've said it to you in private. I'll say it publicly. I, I will try to use you as a role model when I have people that reach out to me to do the same for them that you've done for me. So thank you. Uh, it's my pleasure. And uh, you're a great guy, Bill. So I see that happening. High probability. <laughs> well, I, I hope you're correct. And uh, maybe our pods can combine and we can do something cool go. together over time. We'll rule them like angry gods. <laughs> <laughs>